vision where now we continue to chart the story of the River Thames. Foggy weather when he was had orders to fetch a barge out say to Albert Royal Albert Dock up to say Regent's Canal. We used to look at the weather, so it's gonna set in, be a bit foggy. Anyhow, I chance it. You could get a good start out in the middle of the especially that Albert Dock with rivers wider. And the Albert Dock is wide, and you wanted a good start out. You knew you get her head up. If you didn't know which was head up or head down, you'd throw a bit of wood over the side and watch it, which way it'd go. So you knew that was it up. That's in the fog. And the way the wind was, you'd say, on my starboard side, it's taking lows, I know where I am. On your port side, you'd smell the gas works. You'd know exactly where you were. And all of a sudden, you might hear a little creak, squeak, squeak, what's that? Anyone out there? Yeah, that's you, Brownie. I say, yes, where are you going? Who is it? Boney. Where are you going, Bone? You can't see him. At night, you'd be surprised the noises you can hear on that river. You can hear it miles away, a little noise. Where are you going, Swiss Wolf? Well, I'm going to Shabble. But it was lovely, it was a different world. You know what I mean? You can't understand what I mean. Can you lay people? No. But it was a different world. In the West India docks, where lighterman Bill Brown used to take his barge, a cormorant has arrived in search of fish. Very different world here now, though the ghosts of Docklands past still linger in the plate glass of the garish new developments on the Isle of Dogs. The quayside of the old Albert and George V docks is now the runway for the new city airport. The vastness of what was London's riverside region is unimaginable now. This had been the greatest river port in the world, and with its collapse, a community of hundreds of thousands of Londoners dependent on river trade disappeared. It was known as Dockland, but much of the work of London's port had stayed on the river. Keeper of the museum in Docklands, Chris Elmers. 
Well, before the docks were built in the beginning of the 19th century, all cargoes coming into the port of London had to be discharged in the upper pool, in the area alongside the legal quays between the Tower of London and London Bridge. As trade increased dramatically in the 18th century, so did the level of congestion on the river. And along with the level of congestion, so in fact increased the level of pilferage. London was one of the most um, ports prone to theft you could find anywhere in the world. Something like 1% of all the cargoes were simply lost, cut off the back of somebody's ship into the back of somebody else's boat. A customs duty had to be paid on most goods, and these could be landed only at the so-called legal keys. This increased congestion and made pilfering easier. The West India merchants suffered badly from theft and it was they who funded the first of the new docks out on the Isle of Dogs. Here they could land their cargoes behind high defensive walls, warehouse their goods, and customs dues could be collected. But others stood to lose out. Those who actually had opposed the docks had in some way to be bought off. And one of the important groups that actually had to, to be brought off, of course, was the, was the lighterage trade. Now, they were very concerned about the building of the new docks and the fact that they may actually lose trade. As a result of that opposition, a thing called the free water clause was inserted in all of the enabling acts of the early dock companies. That enabled those um, owners of barges and lighters to go into the new enclosed docks free of paying any locking charge to receive or deliver cargo to ships. The smaller barges or lighters, so-called because they took cargo from ships and lightened them, were steered with enormous oars. By the late 19th century, about three quarters of all cargoes unloaded in the London docks were shipped out onto the river to warehouses. These dumb barges had no motor but drifted on the Thames tides. Lighterman Ted Hunt, still strong and skillful at the age of 70. Yes, the job I've often done is uh, to have a barge like this uh, on my own loaded up with newsprint in West India Dock, uh, newsprint from Finland. Um, we'd come out of there and row the five miles up to Wapping. Old Aberdeen Wharf was the name of the place. The firm I worked for had the contract there. The newsprint would be offloaded into the warehouse and then, when required, would be taken by lorry the short journey up to Fleet Street. Now, a barge like this, as fast as you can row it through the water, is about half a knot. Now, quite often the tide, uh, certainly on the ebb, runs at three knots. So it's going six times as fast as you can row. So you can't row against the tide. But what you do is you drift with the tide and you spend some of your time, at least, avoiding trouble. Well, in the 30s, there was no rule about working more than one night at a time. It was quite common to go to work at six o'clock on Monday morning and finish late on Saturday. In every barge there was a cabin and a stove and the life boy was our pillow. And if you got wet in the rain, you just dried off in the sun. By the 1950s, most lighters were pulled by tugs. Though London's lightermen still learned the traditional craft of driving a dumb barge, they became tugmen. Lighters could be towed much greater distances on the river, but the life of tugmen was still governed by the tides and the unpredictable nature of shipping.
Harry Lear worked on the tugs at Gravesend, towing ships as well as barges. Our working conditions was seven days a week, and it was seven days a week. We'd go aboard Monday morning, we'd come, be, still be there the next Monday morning, and the Monday morning after that, they were busy. But if you got a day off, they'd see the way clear to give you a day off, and you went ashore, you all had to leave where you'd be in case you were wanted. Well, I was in the pictures watching the the uh, jazz singer, I think it was, and uh, on the screen come up, well, the crew of the Hibernia, please report back to work, as we've got a blue funnel boat to do, and, uh, and she was the, the powerfulest tug here at the time, and of course she was always wanted for the big ships, all the bigger ships of the lot. And that's how our life was, seven days a week, and it was seven days and nights. <laughs> The fact that so much of the cargo of London's port was unloaded into lighters and moved around on the river undermined the finances of the big dock companies. When the first docks were built, they'd been given monopolies in trade from particular parts of the world. This was to compensate them for the enormous cost of dock construction. The monopolies lasted for 21 years. After that, there was fierce commercial competition for port trade. Chris Elmers. After the ending of the various dock companies' 21-year monopolies, there was very much a laissez-faire free-for-all in terms of competition to try and grab as much trade that was then still continuing to grow coming to the Port of London. Dock companies, in fact, were forced into amalgamations and they were forced very much to build new docks increasingly further east than those built at the beginning of the century. That, together with tremendous competition from the riverside warehouses, led ever more to get the provision of more and more facilities, both within the enclosed docks and also along the working riverside. By the end of the 19th century, London was regarded as a port to be in very, very good shape in terms of being able to warehouse and handle ships, but it wasn't in particularly good shape as a working economic sort of entity. And the dock companies in particular and also to a lesser degree the wharves and warehouse uh, operators, were forced increasingly to rely on casual labour to actually try and keep the labour cost side of cargo handling to the barest minimum. A great deal of dock work was at the wharfs which once lined the riverside below London Bridge. In the 1930s, this was where Jack Banfield came in search of a day's pay from his home in Wapping. I'd come up onto the bridge and I'd stand on the centre of the bridge and then I'd look along the river, both sides of the river, and assess whether there was a fresh ship overnight arrived, because I knew that would be the best chance of a day's work, well, probably two days. At Mark Brown's Wharf, there was nothing, or farther up still was Hayes Wharf. There'd be the Russian ships used to go there. Now, if there was a fresh Russian ship, it would be a bit of a gallop. I'd make sure to get along there by half past seven. The idea was to get on the front of the queue, of the calling off queue, if you could get a, what we called a fronter. Now, quarter to eight, the call used to start. And at eight o'clock, it was finished. If there was no luck on that side, I'd look to the north side. Brewer's Key used to have the General Steam Navigation Company from Rotterdam and Amsterdam. And they probably, if that was a fresh ship, there'd be a chance of a day's work there, maybe two days. That was the object, to look to see where there was a fresh ship that wasn't there the day before. And then I'd make my way there to get a, a day's work. If I didn't get a job, I'd walk back over the bridge and I'd go back to Wapping. Probably I'd come back again at one o'clock to see if there was a ship arrived during the morning, because there was two calls a day, eight o'clock and one o'clock. And I might meet someone going back who's working at Brewer's Quay. Where did you go to this morning? I went to Mark Brown's Wharf. You should have gone to Brewer's Quay, because we were short-handed. Work on the riverside wharfs and in the docks remained casual until after the war. The commercial dock companies had collapsed and management was handed over in 1909 to the Port of London Authority, the PLA for short. 
There were some permanent workers in the 1930s, but even the most skilled men could be laid off and taken on again by the port employer. The deal porters were the most remarkable dock workers, sorting and stacking planks in the Surrey docks where most of London's imported timber was unloaded. Charles Christopher, who worked there. You could never walk on the gangways. You had to have a, a rhythm, and if you've got timber on your shoulder or even on your back, it used to have the tendency to move. Now, that would be a movement on the top of your shoulder. Under your feet on your gangway, there would always be a movement on the gangway. So you had to create a rhythm, and you could not walk. You had to more or less half stride and run. You never had your two feet at any time together. Oh, the old boys were recognised as being skilful. It was a job that no other dock worker could be uh, allocated to, even from the Labour Exchange or, or even from the National Dock Board. Although the PLA had quite a number of permanent workers in their dock work, they would never allow a dill porter to become permanent. And if, for some reason or other, uh, a dill porter in, during a slack season found a little corner or a wharf or something like that and started working there, and the, if the employer, whoever he was, would like to look for him and would like to retain him, he wasn't allowed to. He, he was stopped. And the National Dock Board, the, or the sector manager, could go to that employer and say, I want this man, he's a dill porter, and take him away. This is an artist's impression of how part of London's rundown waterfront will look if a £22 million scheme is approved. The site is next to Tower Bridge, close by the Tower of London. It's 25 acres of dock land, built in 1829 and known as St Catherine's Dock. At present, it's decaying and disused. But within 10 years, it could be the pride of London Town. From the late 1960s, the oldest docks nearest to London began to close down. In just 15 years, between 1967 and 1982, they all disappeared. At the time, the militancy of dockers was often blamed for the closure of London's river port. But underlying changes in the way cargo was handled and in shipping began the decline. Everything was packed into giant metal boxes the container revolution. This is the weird, gigantic world of London's modern docks at Tilbury, where the hand of man is hidden in monstrous machines. Forty tons of cargo is hoisted in one go, a day's work for a docker armed only with a hook and muscle power. Alex Gander. I started work in the docks in in 1929, and the work was very, very arduous. And you had to carry a hook, like I've got here, to lift the cargo with. There were no forklifts or mechanical appliances, and this is a case hook. When you struck a case, you see, you, you hit your knuckles on a straight hook, and there's the straight hook here. This was all right for bags, you see. You wouldn't hurt your knuckles, but with cases, you would hurt your knuckles. But by having the S hook, you are all right. So, as I say, the work was arduous, and for small bags, you'd have a bag hook, which I've got here. And the merchants didn't like you using big hooks because the, the seeds or stuff would run out. 
Bill Regan recalls his first day's work unloading sugar in the West India docks. North Quay was known as Blood Alley, referring to the fact that you sweated blood when you worked on sugar. When we took the hatches off, the sugar was laid out below us in bags weighing 300 weight each. After I started, I went off with rather a, a rush to show how fit I was, but after a couple of hours, the back started aching. And then a set of sugar went up with a split bag, which covered us with sugar. I was beginning to perspire, but you couldn't wipe your forehead because the particles of sugar made it very sore. The sugar also got between my hand and the hook I was using and rubbed the skin off the top of my fingers, making them very raw and they bled a little. We came back from lunch and about three o'clock in the afternoon, I was beginning to ache even more and I wished I'd never seen any sugar. Half past four, I was praying for five o'clock to come and the top man and the ship's foreman looked over the top and said, all night outside, the ship's sailing. Overtime was compulsory. We had to work through till eight o'clock in the evening and then we had a break until 11 o'clock. I went home on a cycle and mother had got me some dinner ready. She put it in front of me. I fell asleep before I was halfway through it. She woke me up at 10 o'clock and at half past 10 I had to get on the bike, come back into the dock, dead tired. Started at 11 o'clock, worked through till six o'clock with a half an hour's break for a cup of tea. We were supposed to work until seven, but we finished the ship. At the same time as new methods of cargo handling came in, the old evil of casual dock work was abolished. Working conditions, not only of dockers, but of all those moving goods around in the port were modernized, and this rapidly undermined the economics of river traffic. It had become too expensive. When the end came, it came fast. Lighterman and tug skipper Bob Harris. It's amazing how suddenly the, the whole dock system closed up because at one, at one period we had no place to wash or anything like that in the dock. We had no holidays with pay. We had no pension scheme. As soon as these sort of thing came in, the whole thing collapsed. And, and I remember in 1970, when the docks first started to close, our skipper of a, a firm, and uh, we had to we had orders to put our craft into the into the Surrey dock. Well, uh, we could either put them in at the Surrey entrance or the Greenland entrance. And uh, on this occasion, I thought, well, I'll shove them in the, the Surrey entrance. And I shoved them into the entrance of the lock and said to the men on the on the on the dock side, "Would you like to give these craft a turn?" And they looked at me and they said, "What's the matter with you? We're filling this lock in." It was amazing. And they were still building the amenity blocks in the Surrey dock. The final and decisive reason for the closure of the docks was the value of land. It was much more profitable to build office blocks here than to unload cargo. I knew the West India Dock and Millwall Dock from well before the war and after the war. But seeing things with all this conglomeration of buildings, high sky buildings, and I'm lost. It wasn't only the docks which finally disappeared in the 1980s, but an entire riverside world which once had its own way of celebrating the new year on the Thames. Bill Brown. On New Year's Eve, we used to wait for midnight, and it would happen about two minutes to the hour. Ships began to blow, not one, not two, Ten ships all blown together, cock a doodle doo. -doo. Tin cans would be going flying round the street, the dustbin lids would be flying up in the air. Some would be playing accordion, another one would be playing a mouth organ. That was very lovely, it was. If they were sailing, they'd, they'd, they'd keep blowing all the way down the river till about half past 12. 
extended silence. New Year's Eve. <laughs> Gone with the wind. The story.